Uh, thank you all for coming and spending your uh, valuable time eating lunch here with us. Uh, so when, uh, let's see, just so I, okay, 105, good. Um, wh the way this project got started is after the financial crisis, there, there became a cottage industry among economists of trying to figure out how could we have forecasted the financial crisis had we known then what we know now. And sort of, it led to a lot of papers and somehow, you know, we, we've participated in it. And, and Paul and I were talking one time about if you want to be able to forecast stuff that happens in the future, one of the important sources that you would want to use um, are, are news. And uh, unlike more structured data like time series of S&P and macro announcements, uh, it, it turns out to be fairly hard uh, to work with, with news data because you know, it comes as text. It's not particularly well structured. A lot of the text that you get in a news article refers to things having nothing to do with the news. Um, and it, it's just generally a messy bunch of data to work with, but it seems like it should have a lot of content. So we started asking ourselves, how could we, what could we do with that data? Uh, anyway, I, this was working for you. I don't know how it works, but anyway, all right. Let's do it like this. So, uh, so first of all, I, I worked very hard to get a, Col a, a Columbia color scheme with, for all the slides. So th this light blue, this was like five or 10 minutes of, of like internet searching. Um, but so I hope I get, you know, plus the logo. But anyway, all right. Uh, so automated processing of natural language is, is this really fascinating new development because it, it allows two sets of people to do something they've never been able to do before. So practitioners, um, which I was one of for many years, a lot of what they do is read news and try to understand how news affects what their job is and their portfolio they're managing or the investment choices they're making. And while these people have access to a lot of news, they, they don't have a way to systematically analyze the news that they see. That's not what they're in the business of doing, but they read a lot of news. And a lot of the takeaways end up being somewhat anecdotal because you read it, sort of it, it stays in your, at least in my head, it would stay for a few days. And then I read other stuff and it pushes that stuff out of my head and there's new stuff and somehow it's not a systematic process. Academics who are great at doing systematic research have never had access to news data. Um, and they really haven't had this data to analyze. And it's been a confluence of events. One is data availability. People started keeping news that they published only in the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, part of it is attributable to open source progr programming languages that have allowed people to start analyzing this stuff without spending two or three years writing code because a lot of the code has already been written. So it's been this nice confluence of events. Uh, the, the literature in finance and economics about analyzing how news affects prices has, has had some really fascinating uh, results. And it's, it's a very young literature. It's only been around for five or 10 years. So this is, uh, unlike many things in, in finance, which have been studied for decades, what's really great about this area is people just, people just started. And, and there's, we don't yet know that much. Um, but we know little, and I'll tell you a little bit about what we know. And, and in it, also, th this area of research really has a potential of changing how people actually practice finance. Uh, you, you go to a Wall Street trading floor that has, you know, it's cavernous, it has like hundreds and hundreds of people, and they're market makers, uh, and, you know, and, and they take phone calls and they make markets and trade stuff. But a, a lot of what the trading floor does is actually sit there and, and read news. Read either Bloomberg News or 10Ks or 10Qs or 8Ks, all this stuff. And it's people sitting, reading news, trying to figure out what's going on. Technology is going to change how this process works. It's changing it a little now. And I think the impact of it will just grow and grow with time as the tools to do this get better and better. So just as an example, uh, I pulled this graphic from the from Wall Street Journal article, which was talking about this uh, hedge fund called Two Sigma. And Two Sigma is a very quantitative hedge fund. Uh, but I think it's a sign of what's to come in other contexts. So here is sort of, so they have an, a black box, which is orange in their case, and they put in stuff like market data, which is a traditional source of data that's been analyzed, but also news reports and, and Twitter posts and weather and uh, satellite imagery of where oil tankers are and you know all this sort of very unusual data. They put it in and somehow it leads to trading decisions. Um, and this is probably a small subset of the market that does this stuff now. Uh, Two Sigma is a very quantitative fund, but this is a trend that is starting and will continue, in my opinion, in the next five to 10 to 20 years. Okay, 
academic work so far, uh, and not all of it, but a lot of it, that has focused on analyzing text, um, has, has focused largely on sentiment, which is a good, that's the right starting point, right? So the, the initial starting point was they had all these dictionaries from psychologists created dictionaries of what are like good words and bad words and positive negatives. So just to give you an example, like some negative words are closed, fears, disrupting, accused, and then there are uncertain words, which is another type of sentiment, approximately assumed contingent, and positive words like leading, gained strength, and boosted prosperity, right? Just happy to read that, those words, right? So, uh, so people came up with these labels, and then what academics found was that by counting, like literally counting how many words in an article can be classified as negative or positive, you know, by knowing that count and what fraction of the words had a sentiment attached to them, could people say anything about the future behavior of markets? And a priori would have said probably no, but in fact it turned out that yes, you could. So just reading things like very widely read uh, columns in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal and counting the number of positive and negative words, you could say a little bit, not a ton, but a little bit about what happened to prices in the next one to five days, right? And, and that was like a really fascinating uh, finding, which was actually done by a professor here. His name is Paul Tetlock, and that kind of started the ball rolling with this literature. Um, but our view was that, look, sentiment isn't everything, right? Sentiment is important, but let's look at these two phrases. Uh, I, there is a rule that every academic who does a presentation has to mention Lehman Brothers. So... Um, <laughs> So here's my mention of Lehman. So in, in September of 2008, uh, here are two phrases that came from articles that were uh, out uh, in that month. One said the collapse of Lehman, and the other one was problem accessing the internet, right? Now, by sentiment counts, they both have one negative word. So it turns out that collapse is a negative word, and problem is also a negative word, right? And if you just classified them on sentiment, they'd each get like a score of one quarter. So one quarter of all the words in the phrases are negative. But in team like to a, a human being that those two phrases are in fact conveying the same content, right? It seems somehow the collapse of Lehman is somewhat worse than problem accessing the internet, uh, right? So a human being would understand that obviously, however, an algorithm wouldn't have any way of knowing that if it was just counting the sentiment of words. So we came up with this idea of something called unusualness. And according to our measure of unusualness, the first one of these phrases turns out to be one of the most unusual phrases in that month, and the second one, one of the least unusual. So there's something that you can say, in addition to them having negative and positive, negative words, one negative word each, one is more unusual than the other in a quantifiable way, and we think that that's important. Now, in order to say something is unusual, you need something called, you need a, like a, a probabilistic model for language. So you need like a, a model that says, is the language you're seeing likely to happen or not likely to happen given the history of language that you've seen before. So there's this concept in linguistics and computer science that's been around for decades called n-grams. n-grams uh, is, an, is the convoluted way of saying word phrases of length n. So a four gram would be a, a, a phrase that has four words. So we work with four grams and here's a statement that is in one of our text articles. So it says deal comes amid sweeping changes in the US cable industry, okay? And you could, you could build a model that says, what is the probability of seeing the word industry conditional on seeing the words deal comes amid sweeping changes in the US cable? And you could build that model just by counting. You could go, you could download all the, our data set is Reuters, all the Reuters articles that you've seen in the last 20 years and count how many times have you seen the phrase deal comes amid sweeping changes in the US cable and how many times has that been followed by industry? The problem is that you haven't seen th these phrases that many times. In fact, this phrase may only have occurred once in our entire data sample. So you can't actually build a model or estimate a model unless you had thousands and thousands of years of text that would allow you to condition industry on that whole phrase. So people sort of truncate it and they instead ask a simpler question of what is the conditional probability of seeing industry after you've seen the US cable? And this you can sort of figure out. How, how do you do this? You go into some training set of your data, so two years of data, which will be thousands and thousands of articles, and you, you count every time you've seen the phrase the US cable and say that's happened 100 times and say that you've seen the phrase the US cable industry 50 times. It means that the probability of seeing the word industry following the US cable is about 50%. And that'll give you this model of how likely is it to see industry 
after the US, if, the, if then you saw a phrase called the US cable rhinoceros, your model would assign the probability of that of zero because it's never been seen in the thing. You've never seen the word rhinoceros follow the words the US cable. So, so picking up on this idea of maybe there's something about when people describe important events, they use language that they've never used before and they use combinations of words that have never been next to each other because they haven't seen quite these kinds of events in the past. We thought that the way you can define unusualness was by saying we look for phrases that one occur frequently enough. So if a phrase only occurs once, it's sort of, it may be unusual, but that's not enough. So you want to find words that occur often and also have a low conditional probability. So you, you want to find words that follow other words uh, that they don't usually follow. And we're going to call that unusual. And there's a more precise definition, but this is largely what the intuition is. So using this definition of unusual, we look at two months. We look at many months. We look at uh, 228 months in our analysis from uh, 96 to 2014. But this is just an example of two particular months. So here's September 2008, and here's May of 2012. Now, the big event in September 2008 was the bankruptcy of Lehman. And in that month, we found, and you know, a lot of numbers, but we found 400 phrases that contained a negative word. And we want to rank those phrases by their unusualness. Unusualness being what is the probability of seeing this fourth word conditional in the first three. And so it turns out that words like problem accessing the internet are, even though it happens, they happen very often, like the total number of times that happened was 33, or, or like imbalance, and we replace all numbers with just this token n, so they all numbers look the same. Share is on, happened 300 times, but it doesn't look unusual because the words imbalance and shares are always followed by the word on. So there's nothing anomalous about that. However, the collapse of Lehman is a phrase that had really, you, you never saw Lehman follow the words the collapse of before, right, before this month. And also, it happened 38 times, which was sort of not a, not a ton, but you know, enough that it sort of would pique the interest of this algorithm. So it actually classified this phrase as the second most anomalous phrase in that month, knowing nothing about Lehman, knowing nothing about what actually happened, but just using this concept of unusualness, right? Um, and the other thing that was unusual was NYC order imbalance of MN. MN was what we were, when the number was in the millions, we put it in MN. If it was not in millions, it was N. And order imbalance N was not unusual, but order imbalance followed by something in the millions was unusual, right? And you, had, you hadn't seen that often, and now you saw it. So, so this was the Lehman month. And then here's another month. Of course, these months are sort of handpicked because they're interesting. But so May of 2012, there were two things going on. One was this was the second uh, peak in the Eurozone sovereign crisis. So it sort of started in late 2011. And then it, halfway through 2012, it sort of started happening again. And the other thing was the JP Morgan, the CIO office trading fiasco, where they did that hedging strategy and it ended up losing billions and billions of dollars. And again, using our measure of unusualness, there were 210 forward phrases in all our news data in that month that contained a negative word. And three of the top most unusual ones were this. One was billion from a failed, that, that phrase. And another one was the Eurozone crisis. So why the Eurozone crisis? Well, the Eurozone had been seen a lot in the text before. It just hadn't often been followed by the word crisis, right? So that made that look unusual. Now, what about this billion from a failed? So I actually went and I, I found this article. There was an article from May 11, 2012 uh, from Reuters, and it had this quote, but the re revelation of a shocking trading loss of at least two billion from a failed hedging strategy diminishes Diamond's credibility and is already unleashing calls to get tougher in big banks, right? So somehow a measure of unusualness happened to have identified the two big events in that month, which were the Eurozone crisis and the CIO office fiasco at, um, at JP Morgan, right? So this is just some anecdotal evidence that this stuff is giving us some information. Uh, so, so some of the contributions of the paper, which we won't get into the details today, we think that there, this is a novel method for extracting content from text, which is this idea of looking at unusualness, not just sentiment. At a single name level, unusual and negative news forecast future implied relatively better than other competing measures of language. So the, 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 going into this, we thought that like, the state of the art thing was sentiment. So in order to argue that our measure was somehow good, we had to prove that it did better than, than sentiment because that's what had been done before. And so our first result is we have evidence that suggests that the signal in level for forecasting future volatility, this measure works better than sentiment, so we should think about unusualness. 
However, for the 50 largest global financial institutions, there's a lot of evidence that says this information that we're capturing in our measures are already in prices. Okay, and that's not surprising because first of all, the timing. We look at monthly data and our measure of unusualness is computed over a month. Yet we use, when we forecast volatility, we use month and closing volatility prices. So you would think for the 50 biggest financials in the world, which is our data set, given the timing and given how closely these companies are followed, it would be very surprising if the market was not incorporating this news that we're finding about the 50 biggest financial firms. But nonetheless, we think that we are capturing something very important about the news flow of those firms. What's interesting is at the aggregate level, this unusualness measure forecast future implied and realized volatility, even after we control for current realized and implied volatility. And it does so not over the course of a day or three days or a week, it does so over months. And the peak effect, the effect peaks actually four or five months out from when this event happens. Um, and then th there's a really fascinating tie-in. There's a whole literature uh, in economics on, on this thing called rational inattention, which is it, it's not that people are so much irrational, is that people have a limited ability to process information. And the fact that people can't process all the news that, they, that it comes out in a given day has implications for how markets incorporate news. And we show in the paper that in fact that kind of explanation is consistent with the sort of patterns that we're seeing at the aggregate level. Um, okay, so I just wanna show you one last thing and, and then I'm done. Uh, so it, you, uh, you guys have seen uh, these uh, time series models like these autoregressive air one models like Michael was just showing us one for modeling a component of volatility. So you can also do these models for a collection of factors. And, and these are called vector autoregressive models. So we, we run this thing called the vector autoregressive model for these variables. One is the VIX, one is realized vol in the S&P, and then four of them are the different sentiment measures we get in our data, either unusualness and sentiment or just sentiment and either unusualness and sentiment for positive words or, or sentiment for positive words and the same for negative. So we have these things. And what, what's really, and if you've never seen it, it's really a beautiful application of, uh, I guess, a statistical methodology. When you have this sort of model, you can ask the model a hypothetical question. What would happen to one of these variables if there was like a one standard deviation move on one of these other variables? And it, but in fact, what you wanna do is you wanna ask the question, what would happen to like future VIX and realized volatility if there was a one standard deviation change in unusual negative news but that had nothing to do with current changes in VIX or realized volatility. So the thought exercise is saying, we're taking a part of this news that by construction has no, nothing to do with the current level, uh, with the current change in VIX or realized volatility. And we're asking, what is that news? What effect does it have on future realized volatility and future VIX? And so there's this thing called the impulse response, and you don't have to know exactly what it is, but what, what this chart shows, for example, is if you take unusual negative news, and the part of it that has nothing to do with current changes in implied vol or realized vol, and you spike it up by one standard deviation, what happens to the VIX, let's say, over the next year? And the red lines mean this is the 95% confidence interval, so it means if zero is not in it, it, there's a significant effect. And the blue line is sort of the mean uh, of the, the average size of the effect. So what ends up happening to VIX are one standard deviation shock that has nothing to do with current VIX or realized vol, the VIX level actually will go up by one and a half points. So that's VIX going from like 12 to 13 and a half over the next four to five months. And then if you had, you know, a three sigma or four sigma, like a, a more standard deviation shock, you could have a meaningful move in the VIX. You could have the VIX go from 15 to 20, 22 in response to this kind of unusual news measure that we're seeing, but not in response to what's currently impounded in volatility markets or uh, what has been, what you could learn from current uh, realized vol. So th th this is a very interesting result. It says that by, by looking at news, by digesting it in, in the way that we suggest, uh, you actually are forecasting what, to the extent that future levels of VIX are realized vol, which is this, to the extent that they forecast future economic stress, you're actually able to say something about future economic stress by, by looking at unusualness of news. And that's one of the very interesting results we think we have in this paper. Um, and so to conclude, unusualness of negative and positive news matters. Uh, for large banks, this is priced in. However, for the thousands of other companies we haven't looked at that aren't as well followed in, as the banks and at a time horizon where we're not looking at average effects over the month and end of month implied volatility, 
We don't know the answer. There may be a lot here as well. And at the aggregate level, it appears this information is, is, uh, is not fully impounded into prices. And so by, by, by having automated monitoring of news, we actually learn something about the economy that we wouldn't otherwise know. Uh, and, and that's it. Thank you.